Welcome to the Hall H Show podcast. I'm here with a special guest, uh, Mr. Ryland Grant. Howdy, howdy. Uh, believe it or not, we are at uh, LA uh, Comic Con. But we just retreated into the woods. <laughs> There's a forest behind us. <laughs> it, was, it was pretty loud inside, so we, we found a little quiet spot outside. But uh, Ryan uh, just got done with his panel with uh, David Propose. Um, you want to maybe, uh, before we... Before we get to your introduction, you want to maybe uh, talk about that panel really quick? Uh, yeah, the panel was um, was called uh, "Directing Your Comic Book," um, which you know some people will uh, will take issue with uh, my premise. I, I sort of cast uh, the writer creator of the comic book as the director of the book. Um, I come from a, a film background. Uh, I have a master's degree in film directing from the American Film Institute Conservatory. So um, I approach a comic book. Um, as a writer creator, the only way I know how, uh, I approach it like I would uh, approach making a film. Um, and so uh, I cast myself as the director. Um, uh, my artist is, uh, I don't know uh, how the metaphor would extend, the cinematographer, the production designer, mm -hmm. um, uh, that sort of thing. Um, and I think it works pretty well. Um, I, as I warned in the panel, um, you can kind of take it too far. Your metaphor can, can easily become a meta five. Um, and there are certainly some artists uh, out there, plenty of artists who consider themselves the director of a, a, a comic book, and they would take issue with that. In fact, I thought it was humorous that um, right off the bat, David uh, 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 took issue with my premise. <laughs> I was about to bring that up. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, but it was, it, it was a good panel. It was, uh, you know, here's the thing is uh, uh, David, who, you know, I know you've had on before, um, uh, and you know, who's always good theater. Mm -hmm. uh, he's a great interview, and, and, and he's great in a panel. Um, um, you know, uh, uh, um, he and I are process nerds and, um, and I mean, we just love talking about, you know, again, like, you know, breaking down, you know, how do you, uh, how do you communicate to an artist? How do you, uh, you know, get the best out of a, a page and a panel and all of these things? Um, the panel kind of grew out of a, uh, a discussion that David and I had on the phone, um, I, I organize a lot of panels at, at cons, as, as, as you know. Um, and uh, at Long Beach Comic Con the last go round, you, you were there and, and you actually filmed the panel. Um, I, had, uh, I did a panel called um, uh, Getting Your First Comic Published. And it had probably six creators on just kind of telling their stories of mm -hmm. how they, you know, sort of muscled their, uh, their uh, comic into existence. And great panel, and we're doing it again actually this weekend. Um, uh, and um, so I talked to every, um, you know, every uh, panelist on the phone before, and these were like 10-minute conversations. We're just checking in, hey, this is how it's going to go, blah, 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 blah. And then David and I get on the phone. And man, I mean, we blinked and, and two hours went by. <laughs> um, and, and, uh, and, you know, when I was talking to the LA Comic Con people about, uh, you know, which panels I might want to, uh, to moderate and organize this go around, um, the first thing that came to mind is like, man, what if we had, you know, a room full of people just listening to that conversation that David and I had? And, mm -hmm. uh, and I think it proved to be, a, you know, I mean, despite the, uh, the technical issues right. that we had, I think it proved to be a pretty good panel. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. I, I, had, I had a good time listening to, I guess, sort of the, uh, the com compare and contrast of both of your your approaches to you know how, how you get things done yeah it was a uh, 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 very different approaches um, and um, and it was kind of the spirit of the thing you know what I'm saying it was a uh, um, uh, I might have said this in the panel, and maybe I didn't, but um, a few years back, you know, I was I was sitting in the audience, mm -hmm. you know, in uh, in a panel like that, and um, I was a screenwriter. I mean, I was, I was already a kind of a storyteller, um, and I was trying to figure out, okay, well, how right. do I how do I do this? How do I how do I write a comic <laughs> book, and how do I communicate with an artist, and all of these things? And uh, the only reason I was I was able to to finally do it to finally manifest it was that I just I sat in panels like this and I listened to how other people did it and I, I watched how other people did it mm -hmm. and um, and I took a piece from this person and that person and I threw out what didn't kind of suit me um, and so I was just trying to sort of provide that panel sort of distilled uh, uh, you know for, for everyone else and it was it worked out I mean we had a lot of uh, you know the highest compliment is when you walk out of the panel and you have people kind of cornering you right. with questions and people who are inspired now, we must have spent maybe a good 10-15 minutes after the panel just talking to other people yeah yeah and it was um, you know again and I was that guy a few years back yeah. you know and so it's, it's really rewarding to kind of uh, be able to just sort of pass on some wisdom that I stole from someone else who's much smarter than me and much more experienced than me. Yeah. Uh, speaking of other people, um, it seems like, well, I guess from the panel that I first met you at at, at Long Beach, you do a lot of collaboration. 
Uh, a lot of collaboration. Mm-hmm. Uh, 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 but you mean in the comic sense? You mean in the, yeah, in the comic? Sense? Well, I guess since we're talking about the panels, uh, for, for instance. Yeah, yeah. Like, how do you sort of build that sort of uh, uh, that sort of community? Uh, uh, a community of other creators. Um, uh, yeah, that's that's a really good question. Um, here's the thing: is is um, you know, I uh, I decided I wanted to do this uh, a few years back, and I I didn't know how to do it. And um, and a lot of people were very sort of uh, kind to me, and and um, and they were um, they gave me a lot of their time and a lot of their wisdom. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, you know, I wouldn't. Uh, you know, my book Aberin is about to be released by by Action Lab this okay. uh, this winter. Um, you know, that's that's amazing. It's been a long journey, and uh, you know, Aberin would wouldn't be a reality if people weren't very generous uh, with their time. And so, um, I try to do the same for for a lot of people. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, and I try to sort of surround myself with people who are kind of like minded that way. And so. Um, so the people on my panels, uh, you know, again, I, I organized three panels here at LA Comic Con, uh, uh, you know, and, and organized some panels at Long Beach Comic Con, and, and I'm trying to organize some panels for San Diego Comic Con, <laughs> and, and, um, and yeah, I just try to, I mean, here's the thing is it's, uh, it's good for everybody because um, uh, it's good for me because I get to kind of like steal little bits of wisdom from these people and, right. and, and their knowledge rubs off on me. And then, um, you know, the people in the audience, they're, they're obviously, uh, uh, getting something from it. But then also, you know, a guy like, uh, you know, uh, uh, David, uh, Pepos who did Spencer and Locke. Mm-hmm. Um, the guy just has, he has a great book, you know, it's awesome. and, um, and not everybody knows about it. And when you put it up on a giant screen in front of, you know, a hundred people at a, at a con, um, and you say, Hey, Dave wrote this amazing book. And he is down, you know, on the convention floor at table, whatever, 50C or mm-hmm. however it works. I don't mm-hmm. know how it works. Uh, he's signing books. Uh, you need to go down and get this. Right. And, and, and uh, um, I mean, you know, it's, 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 how, it's how this thing works. And I just try to be part of, the, like, the con ecosystem, you know? <laughs> yeah. Uh, before we get to your book, you mentioned uh, Journey uh, earlier. Uh, why don't you tell us about your, your, your creative journey from, uh, you grew up in Detroit? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I grew up in Detroit, just kind of like a, a movie and film nerd. And, mm-hmm. um, man, uh, I thought I was going to, I thought I was going to go into politics, mm. believe it or not. Um, <laughs> uh Grew up in a really Republican household, okay. uh, you know, which is odd to say now because I'm uh, I'm, I'm I'm pretty uh, left leaning at this point. All right, um, let me just get that out there right off the bat. I'm not <laughs> I, I'm not, I, I'm not going to hit too much on that. But um, uh, my dad had me uh, at at age ten standing with a sandwich board at a polling place, uh, campaigning for George Bush Senior. <laughs> <laughs> vote for Bush, vote for Bush. Okay, uh, um, and I did something for every major and local election until I graduated high school. Uh. Um, had name positions on Senate campaigns in Michigan. Uh, <laughs> I would I would go into um, uh, I would go into uh, uh, high schools okay. on behalf of campaigns and register people to vote. Oh wow! Like um, and so I went to college at the University of Michigan to to study you know to to study political science to be a political operative and um, and I got there and uh, you know uh, sort of really sort of dove into the deep end of, of politics and uh, and. Uh, you know, realized that things weren't black and white, man. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I went to Michigan is one of the most liberal institutions in the world, and I grew up in a very conservative household, and those things kind of <laughs> slammed together. And um, yeah, so you know, it, it's the classic kind of college story where it ends in a nervous breakdown. Oh. Um, I'm about to start the second semester, and uh-huh. I'm registered for all these political science classes, and I sort of wander around campus, and I come in. Uh, I'm going to date myself, but the moment the uh, telephone registration system opened, uh, <laughs> um, and I drop all my classes, I pick up a course guide, uh-huh. and uh, start flipping through, and um, uh, yeah, I end up uh, registering for um, two film classes, an environmental science class, and an art history class, and a few years later, I graduate with a, a triple major in um, film, dramatic writing, and art history, and so... Okay. Now, were you always interested in movies as a sort of a... Uh... Yeah, you know what, if I look back, mm-hmm. like, it was what I was supposed to do. Okay. Um, uh, you know, childhood wasn't great, you know, mm-hmm. growing up in Detroit, I grew up in a housing project in Detroit, and, okay. you know, that has its own pitfalls, um, but movies were the escape, and movies were always the passion, and... Uh, um, I just never believed in a million years that like you could get paid to do this or that there were people that actually made these things right. you know? and um, you go to a, a, a you know university like Michigan and everything's possible and uh, and I tried it and it was doable and I thought I was pretty good at it and so yeah I came out to LA 
I had to go to grad school at the American Film Institute. Um, I, uh, I wrote a script called Drive, which uh, won the Final Draft competition. Oh, Final wow. Draft is, you know, the, the classic uh, screenwriting software. Nice. Um, and that kind of launched me. I got, um, I got hired to uh, Penelope Cruz, of all people. <laughs> um, hired me uh, at 24 <laughs> to write a movie for her. Yeah. Um, and the rest is history. I've, uh, I've written in Hollywood for about 13 years now. What uh, movie was it? Uh, it hasn't come out yet. Oh, oddly, okay. Oddly enough, All right. um, this is how Hollywood works. Uh, <laughs> uh, I have been paid handsomely for about 13 years uh, mm. to write movies that don't get made. <laughs> um, that's how Hollywood works. I have a you know very nice house in Eagle Rock, and 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 uh, and I'm doing pretty well. Uh, the Hollywood Hills are full of uh, screenwriters who uh, who haven't had anything made. Um, uh, oddly enough, though. Um, uh, that movie's back kind of in the queue and uh, it might get made next year. So. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah. Wow, we'll have to look out for yeah, that one. It's called Haunted Heart. Uh, okay. It's directed by um, Fernando Treba, who is a uh, Spanish director who won the uh, the Oscar for foreign language film a few years back with Bella Polk. Really, okay. really talented guy. Nice. <laughs> nice character. Um, <laughs> uh, it's, it's one of those movies, I mean, here's the thing is like, there aren't a lot of like, you know, I mean, Hollywood, Hollywood makes good blockbusters and everything, but, right. um, but, this is a this is a small really beautiful like artistic movie mm -hmm. um those don't get made anymore and so i'm really excited to maybe see cool. it come to life yeah I'm, I'm excited to to see that come to fruition yeah yeah so um uh, along your journey to making movies um was there sort of a uh, a particular movie that maybe you remember as a kid that that really made an impression on you that really maybe if, if you look back in, in, in time that's that's the movie that sort of maybe sparked the interest in like movies as a career yeah i mean you, you want me to pick one movie but but, but that's impossible you, 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 you can pick yeah, one yeah yeah i mean you know movies were always the escape i just remember um you know i remember uh uh you know we we had pirated hbo when i was a kid <laughs> Um, okay. And I remember taping movies off of HBO and, and uh, uh, you know, Beverly Hills Cop, 48 Hours, Major League. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, even uh, Indiana Jones right. and The Last Crusade. Okay. I, I would tape these things and I, I would literally wear the tapes out. Coming to America. <laughs> yeah, oh, Coming to America is incredible. Yeah, there's a, there's a, there's a Coming to America reference in Aberrant. I actually showed oh, okay. it at the panel. Okay, no wonder I had that yeah. stuck in my head. McDowell's, yeah, yeah, remember? Yeah, right, yeah right. it's in the okay. background. Uh, coming to America is, yeah, probably like a top 10 movie for me. Um, Here's the thing, but you know, so I love these things, but uh, again, never in a million years this this dirtbag kid from a housing project in Detroit would think that uh, you could actually do this as a living or as a career. Um, so, in 1994, I saw Pulp Fiction, um, and uh, I'm like, man, you know, this is this is what I want to do. This is, um, you know, it, it, in my wildest dreams, if I could pick one thing to do, it would be this. You want to uh, be a dancer? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's really good. I, yeah, I, I, I would be a, a hoodlum for a guy like, uh, you know, Marcellus Wallace um, and, and, and get killed on the shitter. Um, that's my ideal uh, uh, character arc. Um, uh, you know, I'm just like, man, you know, I was just blown away. I mean, I'd never seen anything like it. And I'm like, uh, this is this is just, this is for me. But but again, it just didn't seem possible. And then same year, I see uh, Clerks by Kevin Smith. Right. And... Um, I'm like, man, I can do this. I mean, Kevin Smith, you know, he had, he had nothing. He, mm -hmm. he got a camera. He, he put, you know, about 20 grand worth of cost <laughs> on his credit cards. And, yeah, yeah. and he just made this thing. <laughs> and it was fucking brilliant. I mean, right. it's still, you know, it's still maybe the, um, you know, one of my favorite movies. Wow. And, um, you know, it took a couple of years for it to sink in that, you know, holy shit, you actually could do this. Um, but yeah, those are, those are the formative movies. Um, you know, and then, and then your taste kind of, you know, when you really kind of dive into this, um, if you want to ask me what my favorite movie is, what I think the perfect movie is, uh, Fargo by the Coen brothers okay. is just, um, uh, you know, if, um, if I made that movie tomorrow, mm -hmm. I could die the next day and be, and be happy. I just think it's, nice. it's brilliant. It's kicking on all cylinders. It's, yeah. If, if, I don't know why, for, for, since we're sort of in that genre, like a uh, usual suspects, it's like a, yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's a, you know, <laughs> I mean, that, that's a classic. I mean, you want to talk about, um, I mean, I feel like, uh, I feel like Hollywood has spent the last uh, couple of decades trying to trying to capture that lightning in a bottle again. <laughs> it was so amazing. Right. Um, and and Brian Singer has obviously you know since proven to be like you know one of the the you know more prolific directors mm -hmm. that uh, mm -hmm. that we've seen in Hollywood. Um, but yeah, yeah, great script. It was actually um, I mean another formative thing when I was at Michigan. We had uh, Christopher McQuarrie who wrote The Usual Suspects for mm. uh, for a week. Okay. Uh, teaching our screenwriting classes. Nice. And man, that guy's a smart guy. I mean, <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I'm here because of experiences like that. You know? Well, obviously, yeah. screenwriting plays a big influence in your uh, 
your your comic book writing. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, like, how do you stay current? Like, how do you think of ideas or come up with ideas? Yeah, for for screenwriting and for comic books. Yeah, um, God, that's that's a really good question because, um, well, here's the thing: is like, um, I mean, every writer just keeps a notebook, and you get a brain fart, you just you write something down. Um, I mean, the reason I moved into comics uh, was because Hollywood became so wildly limited mm -hmm. in what they will greenlight. Okay. Um, like artistic freedom and... Yeah, well, I mean, it's like, you know, here's the thing is like the, um, the, a lot of things have happened over the last 10 years or so, like since I, literally I got into the film business at the absolute worst time to get into the film <laughs> business. So, so I come out and I kind of break as a writer and a few years before that, man, you could like, you could wipe your ass with 120 uh, three-hole punch pages <laughs> and you could sell it for a right. couple of hundred thousand dollars and uh, and as soon as I got into the business that kind of dried up um, and um, yeah it, well, before you go on it's yeah, funny yeah. you mention it because uh, I think at Long Beach Comic Con I was in a panel with uh, it's for like celebrating uh, Extreme Studios 25th okay. anniversary and like Matt Hawkins was there uh, Todd Nock and yeah. Norm Ratman how smart is Matt Hawkins yeah yeah exactly I and, love that guy yeah, I, 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 will, I, I will listen to Matt Hawkins like read the ingredient list on like a, <laughs> a, a bag of Doritos, you know. Right, and and yeah. there was you know back in the day they were selling like half a million, you know, uh, copies of a particular issue, like yeah. no problem, yeah. you know. God. It's crazy. Yeah, I mean, it, it, God, it's it's changed so much. I mean, for the better and, and and for the worse. But you know, but here's the thing: is like you know, as as I said, like I came up during the Sundance movement, and and I decided that I wanted to write movies, and I I came to Hollywood to to do Pulp Fiction and to do Fargo. Mm -hmm. And then um, by the time I got here, they're like, oh, we're not making those anymore. <laughs> I mean, what happened is um, the writer strike hit okay. uh, right at the same time that the financial crisis hit. And I mean, things just went, you know, chaos ensued basically. Um, yeah, now you're doing Titanic and... Uh... <laughs> yeah, I mean, the Hollywood, you know, used the whole thing as an excuse to completely remake the way they, they do business. Mm -hmm. um, the whole independent film movement kind of dried up um, and it moved on to TV, which, okay. which, you know, which sucks for, you know, people who had a name in film like me. Uh, but, you know, because of that, we have Breaking Bad and, and, you know, something I always say is that, um, uh, you know, 10 years before Breaking Bad would have been a Sundance movie, um, today Pulp Fiction would be a 10 episode uh, series on Netflix. That's mm -hmm. just how much the business has changed. Right. Um, and so basically overnight, Hollywood was making about a third as many films as they were making, you know, again, just like a couple of days before. Um, and, um, you know, these studios, they're run by these big conglomerates. And so, uh, and so they measure success in terms of billions of dollars, hundreds of millions mm -hmm. of dollars mm -hmm. at, at the very least. And so, for them, you know, I, I heard the story that if if Bill Gates was walking down the street and he saw a hundred dollar bill, okay, it would actually cost him money to stop and pick up that hundred dollar bill. <laughs> right, right. And I don't know if that's true, and there's probably a way to look at it where it is and it isn't. Um, but this applies to the studios because you have these massive conglomerates who who measure their success in, in hundreds of millions of dollars. And so for them, like doing a small movie and making five or ten million dollars, it's the same as losing five or ten million dollars. Okay. It doesn't even register for them, mm -hmm. you know. Um, so, so, so yeah, that, that, um, you know, that became difficult. And so, um, so, I mean, back to your question in terms of like, so for the longest time, um, it really limited the ideas that I would entertain. It's like, okay, well, I, I can't sell this anywhere. Mm -hmm. Um, so why would I even entertain it? And so I would just toss these ideas out. Um, but these are the ideas I was really passionate about. And then, you know, at the same time, there was this boom in comics where you had, um, you had all these smaller labels popping up, um. Uh, and all these other opportunities and self-publishing became a big thing. And so suddenly like mm -hmm. all these things that you couldn't do in film, you could do in comics. And that became really tantalizing to me. And so that, that was, that was what, that was what kind of pulled me towards there. Okay. The other thing that happened was in film, there was the IP revolution, mm. meaning that you can't sell an original idea in Hollywood anymore. Nobody wants to make a movie based on original script. Everything mm -hmm. has to be a book first Got it. or a comic. And so what happened was, um, I, I write a lot of my movie stuff with a partner, um, and there was a period of time where we sold a lot of movies um, just as scripts, and then it became very difficult. Um, and uh, and so we sort of hacked the system. We realized, okay, well, Hollywood wants IP. Everything mm -hmm. has to be based on something. So let's take our movie ideas and make IP first, you know, and then we'll sell them as movies. And right. so so we had this we had this idea um, called Thief Coach. Um, 
which kind of like takes the classic, you know, Hollywood makes one of these films every couple of years where like an inspirational coach type figure, whether it's Coach Carter or Freedom Writers or something like that, okay. they take a ragtag group of kids <laughs> and, uh, and and they teach them about life by teaching them how to play basketball right, or swimming right. or something like that. It's a classic story and everybody always loves those movies. And so we had a movie like that, but it was kind of that movie on crack. And so our protagonist was like a real deal professional thief, like Neil McCauley from, from Heat. Okay. Um, you know, Robert De Niro and Heat. Mm -hmm. And um, and the idea is, you know, he's doing his like it, it's the cliche of every heist movie, right? The one last job. I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna retire. Blah 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 blah. Yeah. His protege doesn't take kindly to him retiring. So short and sweet, protege, protege. They do their last job. Protege shoots him, takes the money, leaves him holding the bag. He goes to prison. <laughs> he spends ten years in prison just wanting revenge on this guy, right? And he comes out, and the twist is. Over the course of those 10 years, his protege has taken that money that, that he stole from him, become the biggest gangster in Detroit. Mm. And so this guy's untouchable now. Nobody's going to go against him. Okay. What this guy wants is he, he wants his revenge. And how does he get his revenge? He's a thief, so he wants to rob this guy, but he can't put a crew together. And so he takes this, uh, he plucks this like young drug crew off the corner and he teaches them how to steal. He teaches them how to rob this guy. <laughs> okay. Um, and, uh, and so it was a great idea for a movie, but for the life of us, we couldn't sell it as a pitch. We couldn't sell it as a movie. Everything needed to be based on IP. And so uh, uh, I'm like, well, let's give them IP. And so we wrote this thing as a short story and we got the short story published. And literally the next day, uh, we had a bidding war. Are you serious? Yeah, we had a bidding wow. war over it. Uh, uh, people are just crazy for IP in Hollywood. That's incredible. And um, so we had uh, we had Robert De Niro and Brett Ratner on one side, and Justin Lin, who directed a lot of the Fast and the Furious movies and the mm -hmm. last Star Trek movie, on mm -hmm. one side. Right. And um, and it was beautiful. And um, and a lot of people were skeptical. They're like, okay, this was lightning in a bottle, a one-time thing. And we've done it. Um, we've done it twice since. Mm. Uh, uh, you know, we set up a movie with. Um, um, uh, with F. Gary Gray, sort of in the wake of his uh, his uh, Straight Outta Compton success, okay. big sci-fi thing, right. um, and then we have another one that's a TV series in development with this guy Matt Shackman, who's a brilliant uh, TV director. Who, um, you know, the uh, the episode of Game of Thrones that everybody was like Gaga over this last go round with the dragons, where where oh, at the end, uh, yeah, you know, you know what I'm saying? It was it was the big episode where it was like they finally unleashed the dragons, uh, and 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 the Lannister army just gets. You know, Jamie almost dies, ends uh -huh. up in the. Yeah, he directed this episode, and so oh. he, you know, so he has, you know, he had a lot of heat in the wake of that, and okay. so with him we kind of set this thing up, and so, um, so yeah, I mean, you know, th th this ends up being kind of a long-winded story, but yeah, how do I get into comics? Uh, finally, like comics were always a first love. I was a you know huge Marvel nerd growing up. Um, what were some of the favorite titles you, you read at, as, at a young age? Oh God, you know, I mean, I, the, the 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 classics really get me. Um, I mean, I was I was riveted by. The Civil War arc, and when I'm when I'm not, t you know, the original Civil War arc, and it sounds a little bit cliche to say that now that we've just had the giant Civil War movie, yeah, but yeah. when I, but you know, when I was younger, I literally read every book, and I'm not just talking about like the proper Civil War titles. I'm I'm saying like, you know how it was, like, and Marvel still does this, where like Civil War infected every title in there, and and you know, if you look at it in the end, there were like 113 books. Mm -hmm. Um, in that Civil War series, okay. where and, and and I read every single one of them three or four times, <laughs> and, and, and that was that was the sort of thing. And then um, you know, and and so huge Marvel nerd, and um, man, you just you look at, I mean, you know, Iron Man over the years, the stuff that they've dealt with. I mean, you know, you're talking about Iron Man as like an alcoholic in the mm, 70s. Right, I remember that. One. Yeah, you know, the, the that that demon in a bottle arc. I mean. It's just nobody was dealing with that sort of stuff at that point. Right. And, you know, Comics Code and all that stuff. Um, I mean, those issues were just, I mean, they just really affected me uh, uh, growing up. And then, of course, I was around for, like, the image revolution. And, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and then I, my tastes really start to refine later when, uh, I mean, 100 Bullets, Brian Azzarello was just uh, was formative. I mean, I, I, I had never, um, I mean, the beauty of that is that you have these really, you know, each, uh, each, each sort of uh, volume is its own contained story. That's mm -hmm. this really amazing revenge tale. Right. But then when you put them all together and you kind of look at the thing from up above, um, there's this larger story that's being told and everything kind of like fits into this, you know, it's a cog in this giant machine that's gorgeous. And really like, if you look at that stuff, it's like, um, you know, modern television. Mm -hmm. 
you know, like they take so much inspiration from that stuff. It's like, you know, I mean, Brian Azzarello was already telling these stories. Mm -hmm. Like, well, it's probably because writers for TV grew up maybe reading his stuff. You know? Yeah, yeah, I mean, it, 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 they're taking the same inspiration that I was taking. Yeah. I mean, it's, uh, and so, so I mean, it, it's what you're getting at, and it's a very intelligent comment, is that like the barriers between film and television mm -hmm. have so broken down over the last few years, and you have this this back and forth, and people are working in all these mediums. I mean, you know, David Pepos again is, uh, um, uh, you know, he's he's a, a, a comic writer, but he's also he's writing TV shows, he's writing movies. Um, his comic was <laughs> option is a movie. <laughs> right. uh, there's all this back and forth, and so um, and so when I saw this happening, again, any big idea I have right now. This is what's changed over the years was I used to, I would take it to my managers, I would go out and pitch it, I would write it as a spec. I never think of doing that anymore. And th that's, that's how the business is, has worked for 50 years now. Um, it's okay, I have this great idea. And so is it a short story? Is it a comic book series? Mm -hmm. um, uh, I have four comic titles in the, in the pipe right now. Um, and they were all things that I don't know, even three or four years ago, I would have wrote his movies first. And, I see. and, and, um, and the beauty of this is, you know, again, when you write for, for 12 or 13 years in Hollywood and, and you write these, you know, movies that you think are great, you wouldn't spend your time doing it if you didn't. Right. Um, uh, you, um, you know, you just, you get tired of like not seeing them get made. I mean, uh, so little gets made in Hollywood these days. Mm -hmm. Like you're, if, if you write the greatest script in the world, uh, you're lucky if it's on a, 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 a screen somewhere in five years. Um, you know, I just told you, man, this, this, this Haunted Heart script that I wrote uh, for Penelope Cruz, it's an amazing script. Uh, hopefully, 14 years later, it ends up on a screen <laughs> somewhere. Um, and that's no way to live, man. And so you, you, write a, you write a comic book script, yeah. and you immediately hand it off to an artist, and the next day, you have layouts. Uh, you see it come to life, and man, that's like you know. I, I when, when I got the first test page on Aberrant back from from an artist, I I, I cried seriously. You know, I'm, <laughs> wow. not, I, I'm not ashamed to say it. <laughs> I awesome. don't want to sound like a wiener. No, no, that's not, I love but, that. Um, that's awesome. But it was like, man, you know, this is this is this is why you do it. Um, so let's let's jump into your comic book. Yeah, let's yeah. talk about it. Yeah, Aberrant. Um, God, yeah. Um, uh, so Action Lab, uh, great publisher. I'm really loving. Um, uh, the guys over there, uh, Dave DeWanch is, uh, um, uh, has been, you know, really instrumental in kind of getting this thing going. Yeah. Uh, Aberrant is, um, you know, here's the thing is Aberrant, um, God, I could call it a military book, right. um, but that's not quite fair. Um, uh, you know, basically, um, the initial pitch was Aberrant kind of centers on this outfit of the military, the U.S. Army, called Article 13. And, and basically what they are is JSOC. I don't know if you know what JSOC is. It's, but it's like, is it judicial or? No, uh, no the, the, what is it? Uh, joint, uh, God, you're, you're putting me on the spot here. I'm <laughs> JSOC, is a, uh, JSOC is a special operations, uh, you know, basically like special forces oh, okay. team. Even though special forces right. is just the Green Maybe Bay. I was thinking about JAG. Spe special operations. <laughs> no, but, um, but, you know, so, so they are a, a, a kind of component command of SOCOM. You know, which is just the larger kind of a, 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 a you know military sort of operational uh, apparatus, mm -hmm. um, special operations command. But they, um, JSOC was um, was a unit that reported directly to, to Dick Cheney. Oh, okay. Um, and so early on, Iraq and Afghanistan. Yeah. Uh, the um, the <laughs> those wars were fought. Uh, mostly by JSOC, huh. and and it was this uh, this military unit that wasn't under the you know uh, Congress or the Senate. They couldn't say anything about what JSOC was doing. Really, uh, they didn't report to the Joint Chiefs of Staff. They reported directly to the executive branch, and uh, and that obviously provides like a you know it's it's a it's a political conundrum. It's right. a uh, uh, in a lot of ways, and so I thought that was a very interesting thing. And so my, you know, my my original idea for the book was, okay, well, what if you had a JSOC that only dealt with um, with superhuman, you know, affairs, basically uh, issues, um, you know, and, and so aberrant kind of reimagines our world. Um, how would the war in Afghanistan have changed necessarily if there were people that had superpowers? So does it take place during that time period? Yeah, well, you know, it, it, it takes place in the it, it takes place in the present day, and those things are still going on. Okay. But um, but you know, the first issue starts out, and um, it feels like Black Hawk Down or something like that. Okay, got it. It's it's a, it, you know, uh, my books are very filmic, just because I come from a uh, mm -hmm. 
um, you know, a film background. And um, it feels like a Ridley Scott movie, you know, in the beginning. And for the first six pages, it's just a, it's a it's a special forces unit going to um, going to respond to this um, basically like an Al Qaeda affiliated madman is kind of taken hostages okay. at a, a gas plant in in Algeria. Mm -hmm. And this was actually a pluck from the headlines thing. This happened, and th this is what I try to do with Aberrant as I I take events like this that actually happened and then, okay, well, let's turn it on its head. Let's reimagine it. Okay, well, if there were people that had superhuman powers, how would this event have changed? Mm -hmm. And so they go there and we think we're watching that Ridley Scott movie and we think we know how this is going to go down and they get there and they pick the wrong door and it's <laughs> full of people with, you know, with, with powers and all hell breaks loose. Okay. Um, and so, uh, you know, at its heart, it's the story of this guy, David, who is the leader of this, of this team. And, in issue one, he loses his entire team to a superhuman attack, mm -hmm. and um, and he's pissed off about it. And uh, he basically wages a very brutal, uh, uh, you know, sort of one-man war on the eccentric billionaire that he he thinks is responsible okay, okay. for for the death of his team. Uh, and it gets really ugly, and it gets really fun, and and um, you know, it really feels like a kind of kicky in the teeth action movie, mm -hmm. along the lines of Fast and the Furious or something like that. I mean, these are the movies that I'm loving these days, um, the movies that I get paid to write. Right. Um, and um, and then uh, of course it kind of. You know, he thinks that this guy is responsible, and then he peels back a layer and realizes, well, it wasn't him; it was the guy behind the guy. And when he gets to that guy, well, there's a guy, behind, you know, and 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 suddenly this larger, vast conspiracy, this government military conspiracy, sort of rears its ugly head, and there are plenty of twists and plenty of turns mm -hmm. and plenty of, you know, fits of ugliness. And uh, and yeah, I mean, hopefully, it's you know, it ends up being this kind of like really interesting layered political thriller. Hopefully. Cool. And you, in the panel, you said it took about three months to write and... Ah, uh, God. Yeah. I mean, I, I was, you know, I was talking to, uh, I was talking about the artist uh, 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 relationship, um, uh, the artist writer relationship. Um, I actually, you know, I wrote the first issue of Aberrant in a week or two. Okay. Um, then it took maybe about a year okay. to actually get the first issue finished. We're just trying to assemble the right team. You try to assemble the right team and there's just a lot that goes into, you know, I mean, in the beginning, uh, you know, I mean, you gotta get, a, you gotta get an artist, right. you gotta get a colorist, you gotta get a letterer, you gotta get a guy who's gonna do mm -hmm. that, you know, I mean, maybe you luck out and you get a guy that can do all of it. Right. Um, you know, there are certain some people, uh, 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 you know, I think of Lisa K. Weber, who was on the, the first panel I did today, the, mm -hmm. the Hex 11 panel, and she's just like a one man band. I mean, she just, she puts the whole book together. And oh, wow. I, I mean, but you know, there, you know, she has a, an amazing writer, uh, Kelly Simulano, and she has a producer, uh, Lindley Forrest, who's amazing. But, um, but, you know, I'm the guy putting all this together, so I have to bring this team together. But um, there's just this period of time where it's like you're trying to figure out what the book looks like and what the feel of the book is, and you're trying to, um, you know, it, it, it's the rule of these things is that, you know, uh, issue five will take you a month to do from start to finish. Mm -hmm. um, issue one might take a year of your life, you know? <laughs> um, uh, it's all about, like, setting the right tone and, you know, because yeah. it's just a precedent for the rest of the series. Yeah, I mean, you, you need to figure out what the language of the book is. Yeah. Um, uh, and you're figuring out, you know, you're doing the character designs mm -hmm. and you're doing the, uh, um, you know, again, the mood of the book, the the, the color palette, all of these things. Right. And um, and then it was a combination of, I, you know, I hadn't I hadn't done a comic before. I mean, you know. Oh, so this was your first one? This was my first okay. one um uh you know i mean I, I have four in the pipe now so yeah. so i've been around the block plenty okay. of times and, right. and you know this has been a little delayed in getting released so we're, we're kind of around the block so so you talk to me now i can do it a lot faster but i was you know i was i was figuring out how to do this because people were so generous you know to me with their time and and their their wisdom uh I try to pay it forward for whatever it's worth. You know, I'm, I, I'm not nearly as experienced or, uh, mm -hmm. you know, uh, or, or as knowledgeable as, as some of these people. But, you know, hey, I, 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 I try to pass forward what I can. Cool. Um, and you said some pretty cool things about trying to find or how to build your creative team in the panel. Like, yeah. uh, you have a few people that are spread out globally. Oh, God. You, know, you want to sort of touch on that? Because I thought that was a, that yeah. was a pretty good, uh, you know. I mean, it, here's the thing is if you're sitting out there and, and, and I have a feeling that a lot of your listeners, your viewers, whatever you want to call them, uh, they're interested in this sort of stuff. Stuff. Yeah, um, you know they're probably sitting at home and they want to make comics, um, and and you know they're probably like me when when I was you know watching Pulp Fiction, like man, I want to do this, but I have no idea how to do it. Right. it, it what I will say is it has never been more possible uh, to do this than it is right now. Five years ago, even it was 
I mean, it was a titanic undertaking. It's not to say that it's not a titanic undertaking now, but it's so much easier in the mm-hmm. age of, uh, of, of, of social media right. and crowdfunding Definitely. and Dropbox and video conferencing. Um, it used to be, even five years ago, you would have to come to a con like the LA you know, Comic Con, you'd have to walk through Artist Alley uh, or go to one of these like con meetups, which they're still very valuable, mm-hmm. I recommend them. Um, but it can be needle in a haystack, you know, like, you, you know, you don't just want to find a good artist. You want to find the right artist for your book, uh, you know, um, and uh, it used to be so difficult. Um, but these days, I mean, there are like dozens of Facebook groups out there now just full of, I mean, the connecting comic book writers and artists group on Facebook has something like 25,000 members. Okay. And it's literally just like, it's amazing artist after amazing artist and developing artist after developing artist uh, just posting their work online being like hey what do you think um and man i mean i i check it every day and i keep a running list of people and mm-hmm. i like man I, I love this artist i'm gonna use them for something down the line i love this artist i'm gonna use her for something down the line so just list off a couple of the countries where some of yeah, your creative yeah, teams yeah. from so i have four books and i have four books in the pipe now uh uh you know um most of which i i can't discuss i'm gonna right, be that guy okay. pepos loves to do this <laughs> you've had him on before well we like, should we should have yeah, met at a yeah. bar well i could tell you, that, you know, i could tell you but i'd have to kill you because yeah, 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 yeah. um, yeah. anyway i'm gonna be that That's guy pretty good. You yeah, 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 yeah that was a good pose uh, um so anyway um yeah so four books in the pipe i have a uh, um i have an artist uh an artist from hungary okay i have an artist i have two artists in brazil um, I have an artist in Mexico. Wow. Um, and imagine, you know, five years ago, you couldn't have done this. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Uh, you just couldn't have. Um, my, my go-to colorist is in Indonesia. Okay. Um, my letterer is in, uh, UK? is in the UK. Yeah. Um, and I mean, that's amazing. It used to be, you know, you, you guys used to have to be like, you know, maybe you get on the phone or, but you, you used to have to meet at a con like this. And now it's just like you meet each other online, you yeah. video conference. And that's a beautiful thing, man. It's yeah. just a, it just breaks down so many barriers. It's, you know, kind of levels the playing field a bit. Yeah. Yeah, and the working relationship is amazing because it's like you know you're talking to these people and I mean you have to figure out how to work because if, if you're my artist mm-hmm. we can just you know we can communicate but you're dealing with the colorist in Indonesia like English is not his first language of course and so you have to be very careful in how you you know how you communicate mm-hmm. you're you're trying to communicate and you know a lot of times I have to like take a screenshot of a, 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 of, a of a panel right, and say right. hey and, and maybe color it in myself a little yeah. bit I'm not an artist, but you know, hey, do this, and he gets it immediately. Um, I, you know, he, here's the thing: is like, you know, they love to apologize. Like, I'm sorry, my English isn't great. Blah blah. blah. It's like, you know, I, and, and what I always say is like, you know, hey, how many languages do you speak? And <laughs> without fail, they're like uh, three. You right, know, right. and I'm like, dude, I barely speak one one, one language. So <laughs> let's let's keep the apologies to yourself. You know right, what I'm saying? Right. Um, uh, I mean, these guys these guys are it's amazing what they can do. Um, and and so I mean, it's wonderful. Here's the thing: is it like. It makes it makes my day very difficult because okay, I mean I, I make my money. You don't, you don't make a, lo- a, a ton of money in comics, first of all, unless you're Ed Brubaker or something like that. Don't get into comics to make money. <laughs> you're not going to. Um, uh, I make my money writing movies and TV shows. I still do, and, and comics is kind of the passion on the side. Um, so, uh, and 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 my life is now very complicated. I have a, a one year old daughter, and so mm-hmm. you know time is at a premium. So. Got it. So I'll go to uh, I'll go to bed at night and I, and I look forward to the day you know the the day ahead uh, the next day and I'm like okay well you know I, I'm gonna have all day tomorrow to, to work on on, <laughs> on this movie okay. that, that that is due at the end of the week um, uh, it's gonna be wonderful and then you go to bed and remember these people are in different countries and they're in different time zones uh, Indonesia is 17 hours ahead the UK is nine hours ahead Crazy. even, even, even Colombia is three hours ahead right um, and so you go to bed and you sleep for the six hours that your 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 one-year-old daughter will allow you to sleep and by the time you wake up you have three layouts from one of the artists and five layouts from the other you know another artist and you have two inks from this guy and you have uh four pages from the colorist and yeah. you have 17 pages from the uh the letter uh, um and then your day shot to hell you know <laughs> so uh um you know it's a blessing and a curse this sort of global marketplace but uh cool yeah. um, obviously you can't tell about the uh the other comic books that you're working on but uh what are there any other future projects or what what's the status of aberrant that maybe that you can share with well, us? well yeah i mean I, I, aberrant is going to be released um uh the exact date is not slated yet but um uh the uh the first five issues the whole first trade went in this week mm-hmm. Um, and it's being processed and, you know, I mean, the, the way this stuff works, it has to get, uh, um, it goes out in, in previews, you know, the, the catalog from which, uh, comic, uh, stores order, uh, 
you know, order uh, their books and then um, you need the promotional period and blah, blah, blah. And so it takes a couple of months to get these things out. So it'll be this winter. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Aberrant by Rylan Grant. <laughs> um, uh, I'm looking into the camera and saying that, shameless plug. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, my guess is early, uh, you know, early next year. Uh, uh, now, how did, how did you find uh, um, Action Lab? Um, just sort of stumbled upon Action Lab. Yeah. I mean, uh, um, yeah, yeah. Uh, there was, I mean. Well, I guess, be, I mean, the, the yeah, one reason I ask is because yeah. we've had David Popose. He, yeah, yeah. he has a book with Action Lab. Yeah, and yeah. we've also had um, Jason Inman and okay. Ashley Robinson on the, on the show. Yeah, yeah. And they're part of Action Lab, too. So it's just funny, well, it's just interesting that a lot of independent creators are, are coming from, the, from Action Lab. Yeah, Action Lab is a great outfit. I mean, let me say that, you know, right off the bat. Um, you know, here's the thing is like, uh, I mean, the comic business is in a period of change now too. I, I feel like I'm, you know, I'm just teaching a class on how, how these businesses are changing. But yeah, yeah. I mean, we're going to see. I'm mean, the next five years. We're going to see kind of radical shifts in in the comic business, and and uh, and um, it's it's really hard out there for for a lot of companies. Um, it is, um, uh, you know. Really, what's happening is the comic, uh, you know, the comic shops, like the comic shop in in your town, um, the the margin for error is so is so small. Mm -hmm. The the profit margin is is, is so. Um, they only have so much money. People only buy so many books, and we're in the age of, of variants, right? You know, uh, oh. Marvel's going to put out the new Captain America book and have you know six or seven variants. They're bringing variants back, huh? <laughs> and, and, and and when a guy wants to go and get all five Captain America variants, then they're not buying like Got it. the next small image book, you know, Saints or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, and and so so it's really hard. It's really hard to get in an image. It's really hard to get in. Uh, uh, at, at, at boom, it's really hard to get in at, at some of these kind of, you know, middle tier sort of places now where it used to be a little bit easier, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, and, and, you know, there, there are good things about that and bad things about that. It's what I've said about the film business. I, I literally just, I literally just outlined kind of the same concern with the film business. Yeah. And what I've said for years is there's an opportunity for someone here in the film business. Like, you know, again, if the conglomerates, you have a conglomerate, you know, like Fox or whatever, where it's like making or losing $5 million, it just doesn't matter, it's the same thing. Mm -hmm. Well, okay, well, let, you know, I mean, to you or I, $5 million gain would be amazing, right? And, and to a guy who, you know, so, so there is an opportunity here for someone to come in and take advantage of this, you know, someone to whom making five or ten million dollars means something, uh, and you can make some really good movies. There's sure. a thirst for it, and that's that's kind of what Netflix is doing. Right, right. You know, at this point, they're making some of these kind of movies that that no one else will make. And um, to Action Lab's credit, you know, they're one of the few people who have kind of realized this and seized on it. And and Action Lab has found, uh, you know, Action Lab is they're filling the vo you know image has kind of essentially be become its own major you know image used to kind of like fight for the little guy and yeah. and and now they're a big juggernaut and and they're still putting out great books i don't sure. you know i, I don't want to say anything but um but there's a lot that's not getting looked at and the people that founded action lab were smart enough to be like man there's there's a there are books that aren't being recognized and there is a, a sector of the population that's being underserved and they've come in and, and they've done it and um and uh you know i mean it's like the, these larger companies will boil it down to like you know it's like oh well I've earned some military book like mm -hmm. can't sell a military book move on <laughs> and um, and and Action Lab they're smart enough to look at the subtleties of everything it's cool. like you know this is this is this is a uh, this is a really good meaty character uh, drama mm -hmm. and that's what we want to put out and that's what we want our name on so, awesome well yeah. we're gonna start closing out the show but I want to ask you a few uh, uh, questions that uh, we sort of have a thunder round which nice. is like our I love it. our random you know yeah, off yeah. the beam path set Hit of questions me. all right yeah. and then we also have sort of like an art watch where we sort of rep like an artist or other creative that you think might need uh, a little help with uh, oh, wow. some exposure. So, okay, nice, nice. All right, so we'll, we'll start yeah. with some uh, thunder round questions. Um, this year, we're celebrating uh, Jack Kirby's 100th birthday uh, yeah, as, yeah. as well as uh, Will Eisner's. Yeah. Um, if if you were to make a Mount Rushmore of comic book creators, who, who, wow. would, who would be the four that you'd put up with? Wow, God, that uh, it's a good question. And, you know, I mean, there's the, you know, there's the like, you know, who are the latest, you know, like who are the absolute greatest, you know? I mean, we're at the Stanley Comic Con. It's hard to, uh, right. you know, but, um, but, but, but that gets very obvious. And, and, uh, you know, I, I mean, I, I would, I would shift more into the, the creators that really affected me. Okay. Um, you know, my Mount Rushmore, my, awesome. uh, uh, and, uh, you know, Brian Azzarello, okay. uh, 
Uh, we talked about that 100 bullets, I think was just a, a, a gorgeously told story, uh, just so complex. And in and, uh, and, and the comics world really recognized that, you know, he's written some of the better Batman arcs and, and everything like that. Uh, mm -hmm. Garth Ennis is always a guy who um, I did backflips for. It's like his <laughs> his stuff is just so sick and twisted, and um, unlike anything that that you know you've ever seen. Um, Preacher, obviously, but um, uh, right. you know even his like his arcs on Punisher. Okay. You know where where he was just I mean. He, you would just flip through these issues and it was like four panels per page and you would just blow through them, but they were just so visceral and so kick you in the face. Mm -hmm. And, and, um, God, um, yeah, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's hard. It's hard to argue with Stan. The Man. <laughs> I can Stan is, you know, again, being such a Marvel nerd. Um, uh, yeah. I mean, it's like, I mean, I, I fell in love with comics because of Iron Man and because of, of Captain America of and, 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 you know, and, and, and Jack also. It's hard to, I mean, it's almost like Stan and Jack are kind of, you know, one. Yeah. And, um, I mean, I, I love, you know, I love the Ed Brubakers. I mean, you know, I love a guy that's going to kind of, I feel like, I mean, he can very obviously tell, like, you know, a, a standard comic book story better than anyone, but he also... He veers into these other lanes, so mm -hmm. these kind of mysteries and mm -hmm. these uh, these these noirish tales that you don't see out of a lot of people, and you kind of have to be uh, a giant like that to be able to tell those stories. I mean, my, my greatest dream would be able to kind of tell stories like that, and for people to care about them, and for you know publishers to want to publish them because cool. it's it's hard to yeah. yeah. All right. Um, earlier before the podcast, we were sort of talking about how you know some parts of like. LA and San Diego, or particularly San Diego, um, the food scene was trying to get better, right? Oh, God, yeah. So, yeah. is there anybody, uh, dead or alive, it could be real or fictional, uh, that you'd want to have a, a meal with? A meal with? And, uh, like, and where would you eat? Where would I eat? Yeah. Um, okay, so, yeah, I mean, yeah, like you're saying, I mean, LA right now, it's between LA and DC. Um, are probably uh, the two best places to eat in the world right now. Okay. Um, uh, I would have to, it would be really hard to decide which city to go to and then which restaurant to go to uh, <laughs> in each city. Um, are you a Jose Andreas fan? Jose, Jose Andreas is great. Okay. Yeah, yeah, he, has, yeah. he has his place in, in, in Washington, D.C., right? Yeah, I, he has yeah, five or six yeah. amazing restaurants. Well, I only, yeah. only mention I'm bringing yeah. that up is because he's in Puerto Rico right now. Okay. Helping okay. out a lot of people. Yeah, so, yeah, you know. yeah, yeah. He's, he's been doing great stuff down there. Yeah, um, yeah his, his restaurants are great. And in fact, some of my favorite chefs were actually sort of protégés oh, okay. of Jose Andreas. Okay. Um, and so... Um, uh, he, he was a pro he, he, he learned at a few other pretty good places, too. Yeah, El, yeah. El, El Boulay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You're, 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 you're dropping knowledge. <laughs> I like it. Um, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, it's uh, it, it's definitely like sort of like a, an apprentice uh, laden profession. Yeah. Um, my favorite restaurant in LA uh -huh. is a, uh, um, a Michael Votaggio restaurant called, oh, nice. called Inc. Okay. Um, and it's just phenomenal, new American cuisine, but he's just doing stuff with food. It's, nice. you know, I mean, it's art, but it's not so precious that you know. I mean, he, he I'll, have to, I'll have to check out that place. Yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, I, I just highly recommend it. It actually just moved, mm. and so they might be in a period of transition, but phenomenal restaurant and uh and another guy i really like um and he's he has restaurants in new york he lives in dc right now he's actually moving to la david chang oh uh, nice of, of momofuko got it uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, fame right right um and so so if i were going to have a dinner he's moving to la yeah he's moving to la oh, he's opening a restaurant downtown and nice. so i guess what i would do is i would i would do it in la and I would start at Inc. and then I would move to uh, David Chang's new restaurant, whatever okay. it gets called in, nice. in LA. And God, uh, uh, one person to have dinner uh, with? Well, whoever. It could be more than one. God, yeah. That's whatever. Whatever comes to the top of your head. Yeah, that's. Um, I mean, you know, we're we're, we're at we're at Comic Con right now, and 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 a, and a Comic Con uh, uh, state of mind. But yeah. yeah, I mean, how great would it be to to sit down with my my Mount Rushmore and just pick their brains? I mean, nice. It's like, I mean, we've been talking a lot about that, right? And you know, <laughs> you know, again, you have Stan and Jack there, and then you know, and then like a degenerate like Garth Ennis, you know, and, uh, and, you know, I, I say that lovingly because I'm also a degenerate, uh, Azarella sitting there, um, uh, you know, God, but, um, yeah, but, uh, you know, we're, we're in a Comic-Con state of mind. Let me stick right. with that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, since your uh, background is in movies, um, if, if a movie was made about your life, what kind of music would be on the soundtrack? What kind of music would be on the soundtrack? Yeah. God. Um, so, so here's the thing. I'm, uh, I, I'm, uh, I mean, you'll see it in Aberrant. Aberrant, uh, there's not a, there's not a, there's not a ton of music uh -huh. that gets used in comic books because it's so expensive to get the clearances. Okay. But um, I wanted to make Aberrant very, uh, very, uh, uh, um, very 
filmic. And so the music became a, a very, you know, central part of it. And so the first issue of Aberrant has three songs in it. And, and the first four issues of Aberrant are actually named after a song. So there's, oh, Don't, wow. Worry, there's Don't Worry, Be Happy. Okay. Um, <laughs> by Bobby McFerrin. Uh, nice. Um, God, I don't remember if it's the second issue or the third issue is uh, Hold On for One More Day by, by Wilson Phillips. <laughs> <laughs> um, what else gets used? Uh, My Way by Frank Sinatra. Okay. Um, oh God. That's what a pretty the, eclectic mix. Um, you're, no one, you're, you're Nobody Until Somebody Loves, Loves you, you by okay. Dean Martin. Okay. Um, here's the thing. is like um, I'm, a, I'm, I'm a massive karaoke nerd. Oh, nice. Like I'm obsessive and you know, I'm not just the guy that's going to go to a karaoke bar and sing one song. I have to get a private room, first of all. Okay. Um, and I love when I have a huge crowd. We'll have to do karaoke sometimes. We should totally do karaoke. Right. But, you know, I love it when, you know, whatever, get five friends, go into a private room, blah, 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 blah. But I'm so fanatical that I will, if, if I have a, a free day, which is, is very rare these days, but yeah. I used to do it more often. Okay. I will go and I will get a karaoke room by my lonesome uh -huh. for three hours and I will just sing every song that, <laughs> you know, cause, cause there's, you know, it, 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 if you have an audience, you don't want to subject them to certain songs okay. like Wilson Phillips, Hold On For One Got More it. Day, sung by a man. Right. right. Um, uh, uh, you know, Whitney Houston's I, I Will Always Love You, sung Ooh, by a man. That's hard. Um, uh, uh, <laughs> you know, but, you know, when you're in a, uh, a, a karaoke room by yourself, you're able to workshop, you know, anything. And if you okay, bomb, so, it so, matter. So, 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 okay, yeah. you're, you're on the open. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's the last call for the last song. What, what, what song do you pick? You're what like, song do I pick? Last yeah. call, God. You know, it, it depends on the mood of the room. Uh -huh. I'll throw that out. Um, um, uh, I was at a wedding uh, recently where they did they did karaoke for uh, okay. for the rehearsal dinner, which okay. was which is kind of awesome. Um, really depends on the crowd. Uh, you know, I feel like it, here's the thing: there are certain songs that you can't do until the end of the night mm. um, because your voice isn't ready for it. You have to kind of like get into okay. it. And so. Um, I made the mistake when I was at the rehearsal dinner. I did "Bad Romance" by Lady Gaga. I did it way too early in the uh, in the uh, in, in the night. Okay. And so you, I couldn't hit the high notes, which mm. was really embarrassing in front of you know a, a large crowd. And so 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 this is how I start to think: is uh -huh. that you have to program certain things at the end of the night. There's another one. Um, uh, I, I'll, I'll do a duet with a woman sometime. I'll do a Meatloaf's "Anything for Love," but I oh won't do gosh. that. Oh my gosh! And that's a really long song. It is. And Meatloaf, you know, really hits that that higher register. Yeah. And so that's an end of the night song also. Whoa. Um, so yeah, you want to blow people away with that? Yeah. Crazy. Just, just go that route. Yeah. I'll, I'll I'll have to see that. <laughs> yeah. Um, I guess we can go to the art watch. Um, we are talking about comic books and, you know, yeah. you have a huge creative team um, globally, yeah. I might add. Um, is there any sort of uh, artist or other, you know, writer or other yeah. creative person that you sort of want to, you know, rep? Well, I mean, the, yeah. I mean, the first thing I should promote is, you know, our, our mutual friend, uh, you know, David Pepos. Yeah. Uh, his book, Spencer and Locke uh, by Action Lab uh, is it's it's incredible uh his his one sentence pitch which i think is like phenomenal <laughs> yeah. what if calvin and Hobbes grew up in sin city it's, it's which awesome. i think is the most it's, brilliant it's beautiful yeah i mean you know and, and it's 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 what i try to you know sort of the wisdom i try to impart to these people in these panels is like okay well what if you know you should be able to you know should be able to sum up your 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 story in in a single line and it's such a brilliant line mm -hmm. and it's such a great book um there's this book right in the middle of it uh i think it's issue three um, where uh, a guy gets uh, the the main character gets sort of uh, a shot with a, oh, a hallucinogenic the, 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 drug. Oh, the spaceman Spiff uh, and the Rocky Man. Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. And he imagines this yeah. like this, and it's so Calvin and yeah, Hobbes. Yeah. And it's so brilliant. Um, it's a really good book. Uh, the the other book that I highly recommend. Um, it, it was uh, the other panel I did this morning. Um, Hex Eleven. Okay. By Lisa K. Weber, uh, Kelly Sue Milano, and Lindley Forrest. Um, it's these three brilliant women and the pitch is it's kind of like Harry Potter meets Blade Runner mm. and it's so good and, 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 and it's so it's so cleanly written and so interestingly written the art is just gorgeous um, and 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 you know it's these ladies that they they started their own company you know they don't have image behind them or Got anything it. like that and and their book is wildly popular and it's just so good and cool. and, and I, I promise you both of those books just give it give it one trade go out there mm -hmm. and and you'll be hooked man you you will you will wait in line for for every issue awesome those are two really good books thanks yeah. for those recommendations yeah, yeah um where can people find you online oh god uh so uh my company is half evil comics so half evil you can see a couple of the other things that i have in the works okay 
uh, none of the top secret stuff because I'm so interesting. <laughs> um, but you know, there's there. Uh, there's you, you, have, you have to be part of uh, Article 13, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> I could tell you, but I have to tell you. Um, yeah, so you can find some test pages from Aberrant and, and stuff like that. Just okay. some and, and and some more information on that stuff uh, on the release. Um, uh, I am on Twitter at Ryland Grant. Uh, nobody knows how to spell Ryland, so R Y L E N D G R A N T. Okay. Uh, um, and uh, yeah, I'm on Facebook. I'm on a reach out. You know, you have questions. You have uh, you want to holler at me. You want to tell me uh, you disagree yeah, I, I, with. I've, my... I've been to a couple of your panels and I've I've learned a lot so far. So cool. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, speaking of panels, um, you have another one this coming uh, tomorrow. Okay. Yeah, tomorrow. Uh, well, God. I guess by the time people hear this, this yeah, will be, yeah. yeah, it won't be tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, 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 tomorrow today. Yeah. Um, yeah, uh, at noon tomorrow, uh-huh. uh, it is a sort of a reboot of our Long Beach Comic Con panel, which cool. you, uh, which you, um, you know, took video on uh, how to get your first comic book. Right. Yeah. yeah. And if um, any of our audience is interested in creating your own comic book, especially from a writer's perspective, I, I really encourage you to uh, attend uh, one or, or all of Ryland's uh, panels that he that he puts together. Yeah. Hopefully, uh, hopefully we'll have some stuff to show you guys at uh, San Diego Comic Con. So cool. Uh, uh, I, you know, come down to your uh, your neck of the woods. <laughs> Nice. Um, I really appreciate you uh, taking the time to, to talk with me and for being on the show. Yeah. Um, in, 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 anytime, man. Yeah, yeah I, I, I love the show. Hall H is amazing. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, is there anything that you uh, feel that we missed that you want to know about? No, man. This is this has been <laughs> thorough and it's been fun and uh, and yeah, I'm excited to do it again. Cool. Well, yeah. maybe we'll do the next podcast with you at a karaoke karaoke joint. <laughs> yeah, we should totally do that. Yeah. Cool. cool. All right. Thanks, yeah, bro. Thanks Thank for you very much. Guys. All right. Yeah, yeah. Peace. All right. Cheers. Yep. Talk to you later